Good evening, my name is Frank Peters. I'm teaching e-business or no business at all at the Hogeschool Zeeland in Vlissingen. And I decided to make this video for all the CE, MEG, IBL and chemistry students who might have missed my class of last Friday due to my illness. The whole video is homemade. I have no OTQ, so please forgive me if I will not be able to speak everything as fluent as I would have liked to do with an OTQ. Anyway, let's start. Uh, last Friday, I want to start the class with that video that I already distributed by email of Jeremy Rifkin. Because I believe that in that video, it is made more clear than in any other class that I have given this semester to you, why you should study in general and why you should study at least a bit of e-business in particular. I will, together with that movie, post the same link of that video of Jeremy Rifkin. Make some time for it to watch it and discuss it with your fellow teammates and with, with whoever you want in the world, I should say. Then afterwards, I would have liked to do chapter 10 of the e-business book by Gary Schneider and chapter 11. Chapter 10 is about e-security while chapter 11 is about e-payments. The one is very much related to the other, as you could expect. If you talk about e-security in the e-business environment, you cannot go around encryption. And that's really the most important topic that you will find in that 10th chapter in the book by Gary Schneider. And he makes a distinction between two general forms of encryption. There's the symmetric encryption and there's the asymmetric encryption. Well, what does it mean? In the symmetric encryption, the same key is used to encrypt a message as is used to decrypt the message. This means that if a sender who is here on my left hand side wants to send a message to a receiver who is here on my right hand side, he uses the same key to encrypt the message as the receiver will use to decrypt the message and to make the message readable. Okay, I give you a very, very simple example. Imagine that the sender wants to send a message to the receiver and the message is the figure 6, like this. He does not want that anybody else out there who could intercept that message would be able to read or understand it. So he can mash it up, he can scramble the text by using a key, an encryption key. Now I'm talking about symmetric encryption which means that the same key will be used by the receiver to decrypt the scrambled text. A very very simple key could be turn the text 180 degrees. In case of a 6, the 6, if you turn it 180 degrees, will become a 9. So the key that a sender uses is turn 180 degrees. He sends that message over the internet. Someone could be able to capture it, but he will see a 9. The receiver, however, he knows that the message is encrypted and he knows with which key. And since it is symmetric encryption, he knows that he can use the same key to decrypt the message. So the 9 arrives at the side of the receiver. He turns it 180 degrees and it becomes a 6. Well, this is a very, very simple example of how symmetric encryption might work. Now, one thing is very, very crucial, of course, is that the key that is used to encrypt by the sender and the same key that is used to decrypt by the receiver is only known by these two people. They have to keep their mouth shut. If anybody else knows that key, it's a piece of cake, of course, after intercepting the message to decrypt it and to read the message. That's symmetric encryption. The same key is used to encrypt 
the message at the sender side as is used to decrypt the message at the receiver side. Okay, we go one step further. Symmetric encryption is what I explained right now. Gary Schneider spends a lot of time as well in describing asymmetric encryption and decryption, of course, in his book. In the case of asymmetric encryption, an other key is used to encrypt as the key that is used to decrypt. Nevertheless, both are related to each other. The two keys, the key used by the sender to encrypt and the key used by the receiver to decrypt, are like the two sides of the same coin, the two sides of the same metal. What happens? Here on my left hand side is still the sender. On my right hand side is still the receiver. The sender wants to send a message to the receiver in a way that nobody else in the world will be able to read it. He can encrypt it. But we are not going to use the symmetric key methodology, but an asymmetric key methodology. So we will use a key to encrypt the message. Which key? Well, this is crucial. The public key of the public-private key pair that is owned by the receiver. So the sender will use the public key of the receiver and that public key is related in a one-to-one -one relationship to the private key of that same receiver. This means if the sender is not having the public key of the receiver, he will not be able to send an encrypted message using asymmetric encryption. Now, as the name says, the public key is public, which means that it can freely be distributed by the receiver. He could have sent it him, for example, by attaching it in an email. He could have delivered it on a USB stick, or the resender could have downloaded somewhere from a public key directory. Because you will see, in the future, you will be able to look up public keys of people just as you do now with phone numbers. Okay, the sender is having the public key of the receiver. He writes a message and then encrypts the message with the public key of the receiver. It's sent over the internet. It ends up at the computer of the receiver and there the receiver is using his private key that belongs to that public key. The private key on the other side of the metal of that public key. And then he can read the message. Now, imagine that that receiver wants to send a reply to the sender, but he wants to send a reply that cannot be read by anybody else. Then the story starts all over again. The receiver who receives that first message will need the public key, of course not his own public key, but the public key of the sender. If he's having it, he can use that public key, he can write his reply, he can encrypt the reply with that public key and send it encrypted over the internet. And the original sender here will receive the reply and he will use his private key to decrypt the reply. This means that every person here involved, the sender and the receiver in that setup, both need their own public private key pair. They exchange the public keys, no problem. They can exchange these public keys with whoever in the world and they keep the private keys safe. Where and how do you keep a private key safe? Wherever you want. It can be on your mobile phone, it can be on your hard drive, it can be on a USB stick, on a smart card, whatever 
that can carry digital information. That's how, in a nutshell, public-private key encryption works. Sometimes we talk shortly about public key encryption. Now, you might wonder, where do I get this public-private key pair? These two sides of the same metal. Well, there are companies on the internet who are authorized to distribute them and you pay for it. No, they do not send you a key pair at home. It's a digital file actually that you get and a digital file contains a bit more than just the keys. We, controlled, we, uh, we call it a digital certificate. On the digital certificate is for example the name of the owner of the public-private key pair. There's the email address that is linked to that public-private key pair. There is on the certificate as well an expiration date and what receives the owner is a public-private key. The public key afterwards he can distribute freely, the private key he keeps safe. These are the most important topics that you should study about chapter 10 in relationship to the upcoming exams of Wednesday, the 15th of June. I make a jump now to chapter 11, which is about e-payments. Of course, e-payments are done in a secure environment. And how is that environment secured? By making use of encryption. Which encryption? Both. Sometimes symmetric, sometimes asymmetric, depending on the situation. But what's more important about chapter 11, and especially with regard to the upcoming exams of the 15th of June, is that you understand what is e-cash, what is digital cash, where do you get it, where is it stored, and how do you use it, how can you make payments, how can a seller receive payments with e-cash, how does a seller know, excuse me, how does a seller know that the e-cash is genuine? That is not a false copy, for example. That's the main point that you will have to focus on with regard to e-payments for the upcoming exam of the 15th of June. I hope this might help you a bit for the preparation of the exams. And once more, I would like to apologize for my absence last Friday. I wish you lots of success with the e-business exam and with all others as well, of course. Thank you.